Okay, we're still on trade and here we're going to be talking about a customs union and how that works. A, basically, a customs union is a free trade area and it's a free trade area with a common external tariff. So any goods coming into Europe from outside of Europe would have to pay a 15%, a 15 tariff, say. Uh, what that means within, within Europe, because it's a single market, there's free movement of labour, capital and finance. So labor can, can be in Eastern Europe and you can move over to the UK. We can get our money from anywhere within, within Europe and free movement of resources as well. Okay, so that's what the definition of a single market is and the customs union. So in the UK, obviously, we've had an enormous number of workers have, have come over and that's led to an increase in the, in the country's aggregate supply curve. There are no physical barriers. We will have the same laws throughout the whole of Europe. Uh, there's also an argument that eventually customs union will develop into having the same monetary policy and the same and a similar fiscal policy so that we all have the same taxes in Europe, which is, isn't what the Irish do because the Irish have a corporation tax rate of 12.5%, which means they've been able to attract loads of foreign direct investment into their country. But really the idea is, is that everyone in, this, in, in Europe has the same level of taxes, so therefore no one's sort of getting a, a quick cheat on the other nations, which is really what Ireland's done and what, in a sense what the UK is now doing by reducing its corporation tax rate. Obviously now uh, Europe might get even bigger. So we might have Turkey joining, which is 18, 18 million people. That has certain political advantages, because it's like East, a Christian state and a Muslim state joining up with Europe, and that gives us a gateway into the East. Uh, okay, so that is a free trade area, and there's also one called the North American Free Trade Association. So that is what a customs union is. Now, basically, the arguments for a custom union are very similar to the arguments for free trade. So it's wider choice of goods, cheaper goods, absolute advantage, comparative advantage, dynamic efficiency, etc. However, if we were to take Europe and then we can draw that free trade diagram again where we get rid of the tariff and there's a net gain of B&D, which I just did in the, in the previous section, section of this. Right, there are certain issues with that though. There are certain issues that if we are part of the, of the European Customs Union, that we may not be taking advantage of brick and mint because these countries are growing incredibly fast where Europe, as we all know right now, has got a growth rate of about 0%. So the argument is that we should really be chasing after Brazil, Russia and India and China because their markets are so much, are so much bigger that eventually we would gain if we, left, if we left Europe. However, we still do 50% of our trade with Europe. It was 60% you know, about 10 years ago in 2002. But it's now we still do a lot of trade with Europe and it's still a pretty major market. In fact, we're a good market for them as well because we, we run a pretty big trade deficit with Europe as a whole. So, but the problem of comparison and absolute advantages is that a lot of our industries have been taken over, but I think they would have been taken over anyway. A lot of our car industries have obviously now been taken over, but also our nuclear industries, for example, have been taken over by the French. Uh, a major advantage for the UK is we have been able to attract a lot of foreign direct investment because we are part of Europe and what would happen if we left Europe to that foreign direct investment and that's a major major concern because that has helped the UK massively because we've got a flexible labour market so therefore we've been able to attract, attract that to the UK. But as Europe becomes bigger or as the customer union becomes bigger it may be a lot of that foreign direct investment may not end up in the UK anymore. It may actually end up in, in Eastern Europe because they've got cheaper wages and a more flexible labour market than we have. Another major argument against it is a common agricultural policy. Uh, because in Europe they charge very, very high prices. I think it's three times more than the price that we would pay on the open market. So this is the world price down here and this is the EU price which leads to a surplus, we need to get rid of those funds. So it's a double cost to the consumer by the fact that we have higher prices and also we have to pay more in taxation to get rid of the surpluses that we have. So in a sense, you could argue that we're protecting an inefficient industry. The argument against that, of course, is that, the, that food is a strategic industry and if we haven't got enough food, then there are serious consequences for the European economy. Right, someone else has come up with a report, I think it's called the Bruges Report, uh, that there's a cost to the UK of £65 billion and if we weren't in Europe then we would save that money and then that could help to pay off our national debt which is too large so therefore lower interest payments and whatever. 
and also within that course is the cost of regulation do we have certain laws that we have to up, uphold to so there are clearly disadvantages disadvantages to the European Union but of course the European Union can be reformed and this is what David Cameron and Boris Johnson keep on going on about that if the UK can help to reform to if the UK can help to reform the European Union so the European Union becomes so that we get a more flexible labour market within Europe then therefore wages are going to fall and and it's going to be more competitive and that will help that will help Europe to compete on on the world market so just as I'm talking here there's some pretty amazing figure that's come into my head that that, that Europe makes up 10% of the world's population but pays for 50% of the welfare benefits or something like that that is not the correct figure of, by the way so don't quote me on that I should have looked, looked that up before be, before the talk so the conclusion is about whether or not the UK should stay with you stay within Europe and most people say that we should stay within within Europe but that we should lead the reform in Europe some people would argue that we should leave Europe totally and concentrate on Brazil Russia India and China and the mint countries because they're growing much more quickly I would have thought to do that right now would be very very dangerous because we do so much trade with Europe and as a and as a block it's 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 we are much more powerful being part of a much bigger entity and we're much better off trying to reform what's going on in Europe and then moving then moving from there the other argument is of course a lot of people say well we should just just have a free trade here and that's really really good but there's no way that we should ever be part of the euro and the euro has led to Europe's downfall so if it was just kept as a free trade area where every country could have its own monetary policy then that would have been far better than trying to go down the monetary union which is which is which has led to very severe consequences for Europe but those but those are the reasons that is what a customs union is a single market is really like a big it's the same essay as a free trade argument essay but these particular things are specific to Europe so we're still on uh, lesson 92 and and trade and here we're going to look at the World Trade Organization now ultimately all the all, the, all that the World Trade Organization is about and it's been going since 1992 is that it wants to have free trade throughout the whole world that's what it that's what it wants in that process or in the meantime it also checks that every other country in the world is following its free trade principles right okay so all that sounds very very good apart from the fact that, the, that the, a lot of the third world nations say that the rules are biased towards the developed countries so for example the one advantage where maybe the third world does have a comparative ups advantage in is in terms of agriculture and that is one of the most heavily protected industries in the world today so a lot of people will see it as a rich man's club so in particular it allows countries to exploit third world workers by not paying them very much money uh, there's an, an environmental catastrophe happening in the third world floods in japan climate change etc it forces poor countries to lower their barriers to trade so they lower their barriers to trade and then the big wealthier countries and exploit those countries because they already have their own industries going uh, and, and, the, and the less developed countries may be forced to reduce their prices because the big multinationals have much more power. Now, I think protectionism is legitimate, it's probably legitimate for third world countries, but I'd have to read loads of books about it to come to a conclusion on it, but my natural instinct that, that it is. But let's just go for the consequences of why protectionism is probably a bad thing. It's to higher prices, obviously. Uh, lack of competition, less dynamic efficiency. Do you remember that diagram? There's going to be a net loss of B and D if we have tariffs. There's less choice of goods. But the reasons why you might want to have protectionism is because you want to protect cultures. You might want to protect your own industries, particularly new industries. Even in the UK, like your green technology industry, why? Because it's a strategic industry and it's also good for the environment if you believe in climate change. Ethiopia has loads of new industries that are just starting to grow. Shoes, coffee, they've got a really strong culture, they've got a really strong music industry. So, and they could also, they've got lots of water and they could adopt green technology. So it's a country that could really, really take off. And it'd be a shame if it wasn't allowed to take off on its own before it became dominated by, by uh, McDonald's arrives in Addis Ababa or something like that. 
And lastly, you always want to protect your strategic industries. Now we could say that food is a strategic industry and that therefore that industry should be protected because that at least gives you the power to feed yourself if problems start to occur. I would also argue the same for energy. So there are reasons why you might want to protect your own industries. So we've got the World Trade Organization over there, which is, uh, some people would argue, is not good for the world economy, particularly in terms of less developed countries. Okay, World Trade Organization on there, consequences of protectionism on there.